If you've been waiting to see a criminal conviction in the wake of the financial crisis, this was a good week for you. Raj Rajaratnam, the hedge fund titan who was accused of insider trading, was found guilty Wednesday of conspiracy and securities fraud. Some of his information was obtained from a Goldman Sachs board member, providing yet another headache for the investment firm itself dealing with an ongoing investigation. Matt Taibbi is a contributing editor at Rolling Stone. He built a case against Goldman Sachs long before anyone in Congress started sniffing around. Matt, Carl Levin's Senate committee says it's got enough evidence to move forward with criminal charges against Goldman Sachs. Our own Elliot Spitzer says in your latest article that based on that he'd be dropping subpoenas by the truckloads, but the Justice Department still seems reluctant to move forward. Assuming that the viewers uh, today have not read the article, lay out your case in short form. Well, the, the Levin report is a 650-page document, and to put that in as, as short a hand as I can possibly make it, what they're saying is that late in 2006, Goldman Sachs realized that they were sitting on a time bomb of toxic mortgage assets, that they conspired to unload those assets on their clients and then bet against them at the same time. And then later on, the, the report also sort of lays out that in the process of investigating uh, this issue, uh, the Senate question Goldman. They also had testimony in Congress, and it lays out that uh, they believe that Goldman lied about uh, some of these activities. Lying well. to Congress. Right. All right, let's bring in Megan McArdle. She's the business and economics editor at The Atlantic. Megan, uh, you've read the articles. Matt laid out a convincing case. I think it's really tough. These cases are incredibly difficult to bring and win. If you notice, Elliot Spitzer didn't in fact secure a lot of convictions despite all the subpoenas he laid down. Um, what he did was he got settlements from firms and in some cases it wasn't really clear that the firms had done anything wrong. The problem is that a firm that's dependent on capital for its lifeblood, once you drop a subpoena, they kind of have to settle a deal even if they didn't do anything because otherwise their, their supply... And Goldman has done that well. elsewhere. They, they, they've come up with a settlement, but Matt, you've been on this case long before a lot of people thought, I mean, one might think you've got some kind of an issue with Goldman, but you definitely think they've done something wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think how any, anybody could read this report and, and not see, see that Goldman definitely conspired to sell assets that it itself did not believe in on unsuspecting clients. I mean, one of the, one of the great emails in this entire document came after they sold $100 million worth of a, 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 a deal called Timberwolf on an Australian hedge fund, and they're celebrating afterwards, and, the, and one guy says, we found a white elephant, a, a unicorn, and a flying pig all at the same time. In other words, we found the ultimate sucker. Uh, and this kind of stuff is all throughout the report. Now, Megan, while regular people were actually affected by these toxic assets that Goldman was dealing in, because they might have been in their pension funds, or it might have been their city that invested in them and lost money, generally speaking, the other side of the deal, one of these Goldman deals, was always an institutional investor. Why? Let me just put the argument forward. Why wouldn't those institutional investors have done the necessary homework to understand that Goldman was selling them junk? Well, I think that the fair argument is that these, these investments are incredibly complicated and it's very hard to know what happened. But the fact is that we generally assume that an institutional investor like a pension fund or a hedge fund has the intelligence, the know-how, and the motivation to figure out what's going on, on the other side. And so we don't offer them the same protections and, that and we I think offer we can probably, we can probably assume that investors. that's not true anymore, right? I mean, now I think we probably learned that it seems that they don't. If, if I could just jump in there, Ali, there's definitely a legal standard that requires an investment bank like Goldman Sachs to discuss close adverse elements to the deal. Like, for instance, that they had a $2 billion short position against the okay, same Okay, so just let's spell that selling. out. Let's spell that out. You're saying that they well, had a legal well, obligation it, to tell somebody they were selling an investment to that they had a $2 billion bet against that investment. If, Absolutely. If I could actually also yeah, no, jump in and, and, here. And, and, uh, let me Jonas jump in just Sarah, quickly. Goldman, Goldman <laughs> actually in that deal even said affirmatively that their interests were aligned with the client because they had a $6 million uh, stake in that same deal. But they didn't disclose that they had a $2 billion bet against the deal. That's the kind of thing Megan. that went on. Look, inherently, someone who is selling you an asset is going short that asset, right? They are not owning it anymore, and you presume that there's a reason for that. Well, that's, Markets I, are I made by people if betting if you're, one way or the other. If you're buying a and car what from you have someone, to do, I'm not sure that, that, that well, right. makes sense for so an we, investment firm, though. What we, what we have to do is disclose. And so it's perfectly legal for a dealership to sell me a car I'm not going to like or that is too expensive for me. What it's not legal for them to do is sell me a car that isn't what they've represented it as. And we set certain legal minimum standards. And that's what happened here. Now, at least Joe Nocera and all the dev devils are here argues that he actually has gone through these documents and says that a lot of these um, things were disclosed, that in fact Goldman laid out in, in very lengthy detail um, all of the ways in which this could go wrong. I have not 
not read the disclosure documents personally, so I can't. But there's oh, at least two. I, I, there's I at have, least two but... dueling, competing versions of these sto of this story. Matt, you read them. Well, I've read all the documents in this report, and I've also talked to some of the principals in, in this entire story. I definitely know that some of the clients that Goldman was talking to were completely blindsided by the fact that, for instance, they were buying assets out of Goldman's own book when they were told that, that Goldman was buying these assets off the street. They definitely did not make key disclosures that they were legally obligated to make. Matt, Matt, Megan, I think Matt wants to see a perp walk, wants to see somebody uh, from Goldman arrested for something or charged with something. What do you think has to happen? Because clearly, whether or not you think Goldman bro broke any laws, uh, any of us who, who followed this got the impression that they, they perhaps were not dealing in the best interests of, of, of some of their clients. Uh, I think that they probably aren't, just like most vendors aren't always, uh, like, look to their own interests before the interest of their clients. But here's the thing. Like, I think that there is a sort of a real desire to have a, a sense of closure on this, a desire to track down a villain, figure out who did this to us. And I think that really underweights the power of human stupidity. Greed, <laughs> stupidity, and, like, poor system design can produce really terrible results even yeah, without anyone doing anything illegal. How are you not ashamed illegal? to do the job that you do? How are you not ashamed to apologize for these billionaires who ripped off ordinary people? I can't believe that you that you These that weren't you ordinary that. people. A hedge fund is not an ordinary person. Well, no, how, how about this? I can't they, believe they, that you've met hedge fund managers and say that, Morgan like, Stanley, which which then in turn took a ten billion dollar bailout from the taxpayer. Ergo, they ripped us off. Uh, how do well, you answer I, that? <laughs> How do I answer that? I think that, you know, in fact, they, they do deals with big banks. I don't, you know, there's questions about how we should have done those bailouts. But the fact is, it's not Goldman Sachs's responsibility to make sure that Morgan Stanley makes money. Yeah, I mean, part Any of the more problem, than it's the Atlantic's responsibility to make sure that Rolling Stone makes money. Good point. Yeah, I'll just leave it right there. I don't know uh, how, how that makes sense in any, in any planet, in any universe. That is just insane. Uh, last word to you, Megan. Um, well, you know, I think that it's very morally satisfying to try to track down people who did things um, to us. But I think in the end, justice wants to make a case that Goldman didn't just do something that we don't like. They want to make a case that Goldman did something that was actually illegal at the time when they did it. And that's a lot harder standard to, to meet. In fact, like in the aftermath of these crises, what you get is a lot of cases um, brought that, that fail. Elliot Spitzer didn't make his cases. A lot of Rudy Giuliani's cases ultimately fell apart. Even some of the Enron stuff has been falling apart. Well, I'll tell you and what. So it's actually a lot more difficult to track down and, and punish wrongdoers right, than we it? hope. Not that this conversation could have been a lot better, but what we would hope was that somebody from Goldman Sachs would participate in the conversation. They didn't. <laughs> we reached out to them, and they gave us the following statement. Let me read it for you. With respect to Senator Levin's remarks about misleading testimony with respect to the big short, the testimony we gave was truthful and accurate, and this is confirmed by the subcommittee's own report. The report references testimony from Goldman Sachs witnesses who repeatedly and consistently acknowledged that they were intermittently net short during 2007. We did not have a massive of net short position because our short positions were largely offset by our long positions and our financial results clearly demonstrate this point. And I will just explain to our viewers obviously that long positions mean you're buying something with the uh, understanding or hope that it will increase in value. When you are short on something you are uh, you are uh, betting that it is going to lose value and that's what this uh, that's what this uh, hinges on. Matt Taibbi is a contributing editor with Rolling Stone. Megan McArdle is a business and economics editor with The Atlantic. Uh, obviously the article's worth reading read because uh, cause it, it stirs the pot a little bit.